Welcome to the Dastardly Dingoes Podcast, a show that celebrates all things nerdy. You'll get an insider's look into the world of comic books, graphic novels, TV, and film, gaming, and pop culture, as well as the technologies that drive all of it. Now, are you ready to get nerdy? Welcome to the Dastardly Dingoes Podcast, the show about all things nerdy. We discuss nerd news, movies, TV shows, games, comics, and interview the amazing creators who bring it all to life. I'm Brian. I'm Jeremy. And brace yourselves, because we're about to get nerdy. All right, everybody, this week's guest is a king among peasants, if you will, ladies (laughs) and gentlemen. Um, We're going to roll the clocks back to uh, the year of our Lord, 2014. Uh, I was a fresh young pup who had uh, no idea what he was doing in the comic biz, dot biz for Jeremy. Uh, and, uh, and I decided to, uh, to jump in headfirst into uh, this whole creating comics thing by means of uh, a thing we have here in Louisville called the Louisville Cartoonist Society. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, at one of their drink and draws uh, that I met a pack of cool cats and among the pack the of cool cats. Cool cats indeed, and kittens. Indeed, was a bearded wonder of <laughs> talent who would illustrate who illustrates and writes amazing stories and has been dancing around the indie comic scene for quite some time now. Um, over the years, uh, our guest has become a pretty good buddy of mine and uh, has produced some amazing works uh, of pulpy goodness, including Astounding Tales comics, The Sidekick, and his new web comic, Trash Shitty. Ladies and gentlemen. Dingoes and dingettes, we give you the phantasmagorical Stephen Bowman. Ooh, ooh, drink it in. Do you feel it? Do you <laughs> feel, feel it just it. washing over I, you? I feel like something. the Holy Spirit. There <laughs> it is. That's Some, something's touching. <laughs> I hope inappropriately. <laughs> Welcome to the show, buddy. How you Thank doing? Thank you. I am doing well. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that yeah. is fantastic. This pandemic treating you well? You haven't you getting uh, comfy in your cave? I, I've it, you know, it's odd being a kind of uh, social um, anxietous. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> that person. sounds like that's your profession. That is brilliant. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> a social anxietor. Yes. It's a doctorate um, I have. <laughs> I studied at Harvard. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, it's been very weird because where I have issues of you know like i want to go out but then i'm like eh, there's people in there eh, you know yeah and like literally worse. right now there's people in there eh, like exactly they, got, they could kill you with cooties but i miss people it's weird like yeah. i you know i it's like that thing you you hope for and you want to get isolated you're like ah uh, it's like one of the twilight zones where it's like uh oh, i'm alone at last and then <laughs> Eight months later. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're talking to baby Yoda back here. And he's right. like, it's an actual person. Yeah. Yeah. That's, but, uh, yeah. I think it, I would it, fully go insane if I didn't have my dog. Oh, the, yeah. The, you know my what I dog mean? is, yeah. My dog has been a lifesaver. You know, I will want, I, I do find this amazing and wonderful in a comedic way that you did not say that about your wife, Jeremy, but your dog. <laughs> That is I'm saying amazing. I'm at home all day long. <laughs> He's at work. Oh, I know. I'm I just messing with you, buddy. This will all be edited out. Nobody will ever will not see the light of day. Yes. Yeah, Jeremy's like, I'm in control of this. There will be no blackmail here. <laughs> no, I feel I'm the same way, man. Like, I've got my two cats and um and my wife, you know, she she goes off. She works on like a hill in an office by herself. It's like the perfect scenario. She did before the pandemic. Like it's the perfect right. scenario. So she can go over there, literally have no contact with anybody, and come home. It's like nothing happened. Um, but so yeah, you can I, still keep it, keep the marriage fresh because you're not yeah. just cloistered in together twenty four hours. <laughs> right. We're not like we're all, all like you know huddled in, getting tired of each other. Right. Yeah, there is some. Uh, there is no some murder. Break That's time. good. Right, there's no murder. There is no murder. That is always a, a plus. Right. Um, <laughs> oh man, now I can't really speak for her, but you know, on my part, <laughs> hey, she's she's awesome. I don't know why she still puts up with me, but um, she's a so saint. yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody pat trade feeling. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, man. Uh, we're glad to have you on the show. And um, what we do with everybody 
um, we ask everyone the same two or three questions just to get started, get warmed up, right? Get the muscles okay. a little loose. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Gotcha. Um, and, uh, so the first question I'm gonna throw at you is what kind of nerd are you? Cause there's a lot of different kinds of nerds, right? So what, <laughs> what would you classify yourself as more than anything else as a nerd? Uh, undateable, uh, <laughs> unpalatable. <laughs> I don't, nice. Like, are those the types of nerds we're looking, or is it like oh, a Tolkien yeah. kind of mountain nerd yeah i like it the, cave the, nerd the dwarf nerd yeah yeah um it, you know i i would at first thought i would classify myself as a comic nerd hmm. but that's dangerous because i always get in conversations with guys who know way, way too much did. about comics or more than me and they're like do you remember an issue 247 <laughs> of x-men when Donald Pierce and the Reavers told me, you know, I'm like, no, I, I, yeah. don't. I have that issue, I I'm don't, sure, sir. but I don't. <laughs> oh, well, do you remember? And, you know, it just goes online. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I get shamed because I don't remember anything. So I take in all this information, I consume it, but it doesn't stay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. And, you know, for me, like, I, I get, you know, we, we, we go to Comic Cons when the world isn't ending. And, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are faced with a lot of people who will walk up to the table and potentially spout out amazing knowledge about comics like right. that. And you're sitting there, a comic creator, right. and you're going, I make comics. I feel like I should know all of this stuff yeah. more yeah. than you. Potentially. Well, they'll ask you, do you, do you know a char- such and such character? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I love that character. And then just <laughs> like, not a know, clue. You realize you know nothing about no. them. And you actually, oh, you just, you like their yeah. costume or whatever. Yeah, you learn to, you learn to, f- to lie in a friendly way so that way they feel like you are understanding them and and honestly like it's not like a malicious thing like you just a lot of people like if if somebody walks up to a comic creator they're like oh you you know you you know you draw this character and he looks like this guy and they start talking about it. you yeah. feel like you might crush their soul if you're like i have no clue what you're talking about yeah so you well, what you're saying is you just lie. You lie right. a lot yeah. to people when you're We're professional when you're liars. supposed to be genuine. Just smile and, and nod. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. That's yeah. a great character <laughs> in comic books. Right. Yeah. That's great. So, so, so if, if you're not, so if you're not a comic nerd in that way, I mean, you are obviously you make comics, so you are a comic nerd, but, but what, how else would you describe yourself then? Um, well, I mean, I, again, I love movies, but people will remember specific quotes and everything that happened in a movie. And I'm like, yeah, hey, I've seen that movie like 20 times, but I don't yeah, can't quote yeah. all of it. So I like to think I'm a well-rounded nerd. You know, I'm the I like that. nerd of everything, master of nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Maybe, you dabble. You dabble. I, you dabble I will, in every nerd. I do. I dabble. Yeah. I dabble a lot. <laughs> Uh, you take that for whatever you want that to mean. I will say I I do have an uncomfortable amount of like Star Wars knowledge of oh, like right. the particulars of blaster models and um, interesting ships from like old RPGs that I did years ago. Yeah. And uh it's a shame I bear, you know, that I know these yeah. things. So but I, it's a burden. If, if yeah. somebody's got to do it, you're like Frodo with the ring, really. That's, you know, the pressures of the world are, are just, you know, caving in on you because you have this sacred knowledge of Star Wars models. And the feet to match. <laughs> 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 oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So you, you are the well-rounded. What do we call you? The Duke of Nerddom. Oh, I like that. I, that, I like that. Oh, oh, and, and now, now you are an honorary dingo. So. True. So what we're doing here is now you have now been knighted, sir, as Sir Dingo. Sir, sir Dingo Beezer is, is from now on. Everyone now Good. has to call you that or you don't answer them. Oh, that won't be a problem. Yeah. Nobody's calling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my nerd. I'm Duke of Beezer. Dingo. Duke of Beezer. <laughs> Duke of Beezer. I like that. Uh, I, you were talking about uh, Star Wars uh, knowledge and things like that. When I was younger, I loved the Star Wars movies, but that kind of was like it. 
Like I didn't really go any. I didn't have any action figures or read any of the mm. books or anything. Did you know that they like, Did you know that the yeah. books existed then? Because see, I yeah. didn't. When I was a kid, I thought it was just the movies, and that was it. And I was like a high schooler, and I found out that there were books. Yeah. And by this time, there were a lot of books. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, and because uh, I was in high school in the early 2000s, and there have been books being written since like the, the second one came out. You yeah. know, yeah. So, yeah, so my were... mom, my mom got me this like uh, it was like Trivial Pursuit Star Wars edition, mm-hmm. and I thought this will be great. Like I, I love Star Wars. This is right right in my wheelhouse, and we played it one time. Uh, and I flipped up the first question and it was like on, you know, like day 200 of production of the second movie, George <laughs> Lucas ate a sandwich. <laughs> what, what condiments did he put on the sandwich? See that right there. And I'm like, like no. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. that That's why I, I hate trivial pursuit because right. they pull that stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, no one should ever know this information. Yeah. What were you going to say? I was going to say it was a BLT and uh, <laughs> just standard mayo. I'm sorry. Lord, Lord Beezer knows. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't know all of the uh, various production tidbits like that. So mm. I pretty much stuck to, you know, the fictional world or universe galaxy that, yeah. that it was in kind of really just uh, captured my imagination as a, as a youth mm. and as an adult and as whatever I am now. <laughs> Amalgam of man and child. Yeah. A, a, a duke of nerddom a is what duke. you are. Could duke you, of... can we turn your name into like a verb? Like you are a beezer? Uh, you got beezered. Uh, That's, that should be like, uh, That's a bumper sticker. You got beezered. Oh my gosh. There, we're, <laughs> next season, we're going to start a segment called You Got Beezered. And that's, and you just like randomly come in and prank people. That's, that's I just trick yeah. people on the street. <laughs> Just hateful stuff like ah, you, you got just walk up, You walk up, you push a stroller over, and you run Knock away. Knock a sandwich out of their hands. Yeah, yeah beezer. Then I pick it up off the ground and eat it. Yeah, right in front. We'll of We'll give them. you like the meeting ID and password for uh, our Zoom calls, and so yeah. Yeah. every once in a while, you're just like jumping up, ah, and then <laughs> and then out. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> a logo pops up. <laughs> You've got beezer. You got beezer. I like it. We're gonna do that. Look out, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) (laughs) The segment no one wanted. Indeed. No one wanted it. No one asked for it. Yet here it is. You got beezered. Oh, it's already off the rails. I love it. Yes, it it is. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) What did you expect? Oh, nothing less. Nothing less. All right. So down to the dreaded questions that everyone hates and... (laughs) can't answer ever <laughs> okay <clears throat> what are your top five movies of all time this is a very deep and philosophical question yeah because i had to ask myself like is it movies that kind of shaped your personality mm-hmm. in a certain way or is it just movies that entertained you or could it be just things that you don't even think about that you like but every time you pass by it on a channel or you get stuck. See it in a streaming yeah. service. You just oh, watch good, it. Yeah, that's a good way to think through it. I mean, if it's that, then it's like Mortal Kombat. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Con Air. <laughs> Die Hard 3. Uh, Golden Eye. And Good Burger. You know, like, <laughs> Hold on. You scroll through the TV and find Good Burger? What channels, sir? Because I'm ready. Uh, I have it on DVD, so I can watch yeah. Good Burger. Any, I also have the uh, sequel to Good Burger, which is hold only on, a, which hold is only on. a novel. Oh, okay. I was about to say, wait a minute. It's now. a novel, and, and they wrote a novel as a sequel. Well, it's it's about sixty pages. I don't know. If I oh, okay, a novel. novella, if you yeah. will. Yeah. yeah, fine literature to say <laughs> anything, but yeah, it's up there with Dracula and Charles Dickens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, actual five favorite movies I might actually put Con in, Con Air in there because I mean Nicholas Cage's oh. Alabama accent like I, he had to have watched Forrest Gump for like <laughs> three minutes and then said I got it yep. nailed it <laughs> put the bunny down <laughs> and nothing beats nothing beats 
the the shot with him, you know, his hair just flowing in the his wind, his hair smiles, flowing yeah, in the wind. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. It is. It's a mane oh, of it. yeah. It's a mane of uh, of craziness. But I I think of that one because I, I am a huge John Cusack fan. So oh yeah. Um, That's right. He is in Con Air. Oh, he is. He is. Oh, yeah. Wait, what? Uh, John Cusack. Who is he? Oh, I um, mean, I know who John Cusack is. Well, he, okay. Uh, At first, it's like uh, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, he's a special agent uh, Larkin, I believe. He's like the guy who okay. runs the uh, prison plane transfer system you know and that awesome. he's always like yeah. that's my plane <laughs> you know what i was gonna imdb it but i don't have to because i just got seen it a hundred times you, got, <laughs> you, got, you just beezered. got beezered which is <laughs> useless information being forced into your head <laughs> your wife's birthday just popped out but it's you know <laughs> cusack's character name and con air now so let's be honest the wife's birthday was never there yeah, you know it, yeah. no you, yeah. facebook reminds me she of reminds it. you so why bother right. exactly you know, yeah i've been uh, i've been watching the show uh utopia on uh oh, on I mean, amazon yeah. prime yeah yes i need, to, I need to watch that yeah that's uh, on John the list Cusack is in it and it's it's insane the yeah. show in general is insane but yeah it it looks really good i definitely like it is incredible <laughs> i just want to see it because it looks like rain wilson has a pretty good role in it yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah. it's a great great role i like seeing him in non-dwight roles because it's mm. weird what yeah, was like, the uh i can't remember the, the superhero movie he did oh he's like he's like a vigilante is it just called super it might yeah. be yeah it might yeah be. Yeah. Ellen Page is like his sidekick. Yes. It was it, it came out like right dark. after yeah, it came out right after Kick Ass. And so it really kind of went under yeah, the radar. Yeah. 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 So here's but another one's movie. I can't call myself a mooner because I, I remember nothing about that movie. Just right. oh. the basic things about it, the, yeah. the stars. Yeah, I, I just I saw it when it first came out. I was like, oh look, it's kick ass with white. I didn't. I never watched it. Well, that's enough, so, right? That's, yeah, I feel. I was like, oh, that's like okay. a movie tagline. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay. I, I don't need to see. Says this that now. on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's kick ass, but white. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh man. Sorry. Um, right, so, so okay. is Con Air then your first? Uh, your... No, let's go with. Um. um <laughs> Eternal sunshine. Of the spotless mind. Whoa, you just went deep really, really quick. I is it okay? Is it deep? I thought, is deep? It, am I thinking of the right movie? Yeah, is it Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey uh, and uh Titanic uh, Lady Kate Winslet. There it is. Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, it's uh I don't know, I just related to the premise of <laughs> like you want this person out of your head, so like you want to forget about them so much you will erase these memories and then you know, the problems that come with that was yeah. Yeah. who, who was hurt you, sir. My goodness. <laughs> How long do we have on this? Uh, <laughs> it's the dingo pop. therapy session. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got the, I've got the paid version so we can yeah. go <laughs> however long you need, buddy. Oh, this is a we, marathon. Yeah. We only charge by the minute. So you're good. Uh, I won't name names, but it was uh, <laughs> just relatable. So I enjoyed it. I thought, yeah. I thought it was a good movie. Obviously, because Sweet. I've put it in my top five. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I honestly, in, this, in all seriousness, I do think movies that you can relate to on that level just stick out so yeah. much. They do. Um, they, like, it was one of those movies where, like, I wasn't necessarily excited to see it or anything. But once I finally watched it, you know, yeah. it was like, oh, that was really good. Like yeah. A movie that, that I um, is similar to me, it does that for me is, um, oh, gosh, now I can't remember. The um, the wallflowers. Perks of being a wallflower. Perks of being a wallflower. Being a wallflower. We're okay. gonna yeah, we're gonna do that again. <laughs> um, the you movie Jake and Dylan man with the. Uh... <laughs> no, yeah, the perks of being perks of being a wallflower. Uh, it was a movie that like I didn't like. It looked pretty good, mm. um, but like I did not expect it to be what it was. And it's this amazing coming of age dealing with you know past um stuff i mean i didn't go through what his character goes through in the movie but like i didn't have to like i felt that and i could relate you know just right. every coming of age story has that like you overcome the demons of your past and you're walking into the unknown 
with some friends and and that was just something that i resonated with very much so so i can i completely understand you know that like connecting with a movie on that level as well especially one you didn't expect to get you it's a special treat <laughs> it is um i will throw another john cusack movie at you um gross point blank nice uh, okay. movie in the 90s uh mini driver it's got dan Aykroyd in it and mm-hmm. uh Alan Arkin, but it, that's a great movie. It's I got a great Alan soundtrack. Arkin. Oh, Alan Arkin's always yeah. amazing. <laughs> he's, he's great. But uh, yeah, I love that movie. Great soundtrack. Just I can always watch that. Never get tired of it. Um, I don't. I don't know if this is cliche, but it just. I watched this movie at a time when I was. Becoming a man, and <laughs> not not really. I'm not even there yet. Um, but where I was kind of in a, a creative, formative area as far as telling stories and wanting to create as a youngster. It's probably not the movie you should watch as a youngster, but um, Pulp Fiction. Oh, it's that is on like every guest's top five. Yeah. It, like, I mean, if you're a creator, yeah, it, it kind of resonates with you in the way that you know the story is told and the different elements and the way it's non-linear and you know it just it makes you think about the stories you're telling and how you want to piece them together and develop the characters and then and do you need to give them this information right now or should we yeah dive into this later and tie it back into this and that so i yeah that one always kind of pops into my head as far as just things that stuck with me, you know, the first time I saw it and kind of uh, made me think about what I'm doing. Yeah. Because uh, Tarantino, and it's funny. Cause like, I love Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction is not my favorite Tarantino film, but I think it's the best. Um, <laughs> I get that. Yeah. yeah like it, it, it's, it's his, like, it's it's his best work his magnum opus if you will right. and, and then but like you know my favorite personally is django unchained i just love that story and the acting is phenomenal and it was the first time you really saw leonardo dicaprio as a great villain oh, yeah. um and so that like the, the birth a thousand memes <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um but uh but no yeah pulp fiction it, it's something that stuck with me one of our guests said um earlier in the season that you know he just he never had heard dialogue like that in a movie you know like you open in on the on the the diner sequence and it's just like yep. it's immediately you know there's this is something completely different than anything yeah, I'm, a, you've ever I'm seen. a big tim roth fan too so that was yes yeah that was a a good cameo role with him in there mm-hmm, for sure and and so but like that movie there you're right if you're a creator you have to appreciate that movie on yeah, some level i think so yeah yeah I think, or you're uh, not really creative, so. <laughs> or you, yeah, we, you we, we are, we've decided it here, folks, on the Dastardly <laughs> Dingoes podcast. You don't like this movie, <laughs> you're not a creator, you're out of the guild. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, Aaron Sorkin is another guy that uh, mm. you can just hear like when people start talking, you're like, oh, that's Aaron Sorkin movie, <laughs> oh, or TV yeah, show or you yeah. know, whatever. Same, same with Pulp Fiction. Yeah, I think there's even comic book writers like that where you, I mean, the one that jumps to my mind is like Brian Michael Bendis, where it's yeah. like, oh, this is Bendis dialogue, and that it's not for everybody, but some people kind of it resonates with, and then yeah. some people feel like it's you know just a spike being drove into their <laughs> eyeball that yeah. they have to read it. But another one that's exactly like that description is Frank Miller. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, you're reading a Frank Miller book when you're sure. reading it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of noir dialogue, a lot of inner, inner thoughts about bitterness and anger. <laughs> <laughs> that resonates. Indeed. Sure. <laughs> uh, how many have I named as far uh, as movies now? Four. I four? think four. four. Three or four. So, so you've got, you said, well, you said Con Air, Pulp Fiction, but Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was I your first. I think I took Con Air off the list. Took it off. Okay. It's gone. It's, All it's, right. It's honorable. <laughs> We're scratching it out. Air. So right. gross point blank. Um, Spotless Eternal Spine. Sunshine, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. So we're at three. So we're at um, yeah, so. Empire Strikes Back. Yes. 
because I am a Star Wars guy. So that movie is just, it never gets old to me. I can watch it anytime. It's, you know, I love all the Star Wars, but that one is just, I don't know, special to me for some reason. Yeah. And that I don't know if it was, uh, I remember watching on Christmas morning for some reason. So it's like a tradition to watch watch that on Christmas Day. But oh, so when the Star Wars movies started coming out at Christmas time, I bet that was kind of special for you. Did they come out? Oh, the uh, yeah, the, the, the new trilogy. Yeah, yeah, you know, not the prequels. They didn't. No, do that. I was but like, yeah, why not- are we doing this bull crap? Let's move it back to <laughs> summer. I don't want to stand in line in December. It's the yeah. holidays. Well, see, now, though, we got those fancy theaters where you got the recliner seating, and it's literally, it is an introvert's dream. You don't have to stand in line. You get on your computer, you choose the seat, you show up when you want, preferably before it starts. The only thing about reserve seating is such a head, like, if you've got a group of, like, 12 people. Yes. You got to get everybody on a a Zoom call and be like, all right, everybody click this seat. This is your seat. This is mine. Yeah. Well... Molly's not getting here until 18 minutes after the movie starts, so I'll have to go and give her a ticket. Yeah, uh, I bought them all for everybody. So, but um, yeah, Love Empire Strikes Back. Um, I just had to throw a Star Wars in there since. Yeah, man, as you should. Actually, Empire Strikes Back is another one that keeps recurring in people's top five that we have. Yeah, I think I feel like as far as um, you can get almost anybody who's not necessarily a star Wars fan to watch empire strikes back and they may not love it, yeah, but it won't grate on their nerves. Maybe like some of the others will, or like, this is stupid. Why is that robot talking? You know, it's like, well, it I, has, think there, I think there it has a little more gravitas to it. It's a little more serious, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think the big takeaway, like, and I think that this is also why so many people say episode three is one of their favorite star Wars movie. The bad guys win in the end which is not what happens in any other star Wars. Movie. Right. You know, like, and this is the first one that did it that way. Mm-hmm. And it, le- it leaves you on a cliffhanger. One of the most in, you know, love lovable characters on, you know, everyone loves Han Solo and, you know, he's like not dead, but you know, you know, he's in, in carbonate and, and is whisked away to job of the hut and you don't know what happens to him. Yeah. And it's have... just, we and it's the first that. time that you, you meet Yoda and you know all that so like it's just it's a really cool it's a really cool dynamic that i don't think anybody really ever saw before and if you watch the first star wars movie and then you watch empire strikes back you're like holy crap this is on a whole new level yeah yeah because i think you see some character development in there too from the yeah. first movie so it's yeah it, and the scripting was seems to me better than in some of the other movies yeah where, yeah yeah and and you know not uh, look i'm a huge i I have so much respect for george lucas i think as a storyteller as a storyteller the dude's genius uh as a writer and a director not so much he's not i mean he's making movies i'm not but you know like it's you know it's it's uh you know if you look like he when he takes the story he writes the story he kind of guides the script writer and then hands it to somebody and then kind of works as a producer over the project. It's so much better. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think of the prequels in that his plot, like I, I think the way like Palpatine rose to power and everything, I thought it was pretty genius. Like yeah. the way everything kind of fell into place and it manipulated stuff and made it like this, a guy taking over the galaxy that can't happen, but all yeah. these things falling into place. You're like, yeah, well, that happened. You yeah. Know? But the dialogue, like, <laughs> Love the the not the love sequences, but like the the romantic scenes. It's like, no, oh. because I'm so oh, in love same. with you. Oh, oh, it's it hurts. I yeah. like to this day when I do my Star Wars marathons, I'll just skip that scene every it's, time. It's the, you painful. Know, it's, oh, it's so painful, and I'm like, oh, for guys, you to, for you to write like Natalie Portman is a a wonderful actor. Oh yeah, but for you to write dialogue <laughs> that she cannot make seem. Real. palatable in any yeah. way it has to be so bad so i think george is a robot and, and you can't <laughs> you can't write human dialogue and emotions if you right haven't up. experienced them in an actual way so i, I give him a pass on that but yeah right oh yeah george brilliant, brilliant as a creator and, uh, oh brilliant absolutely brilliant 
but yeah, can't don't don't let him write your love story. <laughs> All right, so Empire Strikes Back, that was four. What's the fifth and final movie, sir? Number one is Better Off Dead, another John Cusack oh. classic from the 80s. I have loved that movie since I saw it as a kid. It's just, it's funny and it's also just ridiculous <laughs> and just like dialogue that just stays in your head and like gee ricky i'm real sorry your mom blew up you know stuff like that <laughs> what year did that one come out i want to say 85 or 86 it was mid 80s it yeah, was because real... it was was it, it was during his like john hughes yeah i, stuff, I think it was right? like right after he had done like 16 candles and right stuff like that or he can't like, like, that might have been like his first featuring role okay you know as a teen star i don't yeah, think I've I remember, yeah it was uh, one of his really like he says one of his really early ones yeah. and so yeah I've, i don't know that i've even seen it all the way through it was written and directed by savage steve holland the creator of eek the cat really right? who also did one crazy summer which is another Cusack movie that's awesome and there's uh, a scene in that you you can look it up on YouTube I'm pretty sure it's in, on there where Bobcat Goldthwait is talking about his childhood and it's, it's so hilarious but yeah look up why are you so fat on on YouTube and I think that <laughs> all right scene comes up it's only a few seconds but it's oh that's great it's amazing but so I think it's safe to say John Cusack is probably your favorite actor I, I would say so yeah yeah you seem to know like a lot about him, which is great. Like, I don't know that I can actually pick a favorite actor, but. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I would always give a nod to Harrison Ford because he's in so many, so many movies. I yes. love like yep. the Indiana Jones movies and star Wars and uh working girl, you know, one of the, I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, just dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's enough like, for today yeah all right that was Rolodex a great interview like uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was in the i was doing the same thing i was like working girl what <laughs> melanie griffith and uh, <laughs> sigourney weaver but, all right no so uh, yeah i would say q sex probably my favorite yeah all right cool man that's i, I dig it um so this is actually a two-part question yeah oh boy yeah uh we're moving on to comics now so yeah, I, top five comics you know, like single issues or like whatever you want to do with it like if you want to do like my favorite is chris claremont x-men like that's fine um, or graphic novels or whatever you want to do man i will say and i can't put these in a specific order but um the dark knight returns frank miller mm. was I mean, that's probably on a lot of people's list, but yeah. that was one of those. It's on mine. Like, like when I had, well, let me take you in the way back machine. Oh, yes, please do. As a, a kid, I, as, <laughs> <laughs> as a kid, I love comics. But then, you know, I was around 11 or 12. I kind of got out of them because, you know, I was riding my bike, you know, like had a red mongoose California. And I'm, oh, wow. Uh, Jumping yes. dirt hills, you know, who cares about comics, you know, there's, right. there's a life to lead. <laughs> <laughs> but um, then a couple of years later, I, I went to a comic book shop with, with my friend Todd, just, you know, just to tag along. We rode our bikes up to this little, it's basically a house where a guy sold comics out of it, but um, sounds not sketchy. shady, at not all. shady at not all. Not at all. <laughs> Where'd you get those books, son? Oh, <laughs> Leonard down the street. He sells them out of his dark basement. Also got me some candy. It was a great time. It's the good Thanks. candy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that I saw a Todd McFarlane cover, Amazing Spider-Man. I think it was 321. Hmm. And everything changed. Like everything just flipped on its head. Yeah. Whereas before that point, I had only followed characters. Like I only cared about characters, you know, mm. like I, I didn't pay attention to artists. I couldn't tell, I couldn't differentiate between who is drawn Spider-Man in a, in a comic book. Right. It was just, this is Spider-Man and he's doing right. awesome stuff. And that's all I, I care like about. Yeah. yeah. 
But when I saw that Todd McFarlane cover, it was just a, a whole new world, you know? I won't break into song. I was going to say, did the, did the Aladdin song? Just magic? <laughs> I was don't on a magic you, carpet. You yeah. Close your eyes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> did did so, Todd McFarlane come out from the back? I can show you the world. Uh, you I wish. That, yeah. There would yeah. be a lawsuit now. Like he wouldn't believe. <laughs> but um, no, so that, that kind of changed everything. So then I started just diving into different iconic stories and, things that I had missed as a kid and hadn't ever seen before. So I got a copy of, you know, heard a lot about Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. So picked up a copy of that within, you know, a few months after getting back into comics and mm -hmm. kind of blew me away. You know, I was a whole different yeah. type of, of story than I had, had read before. So mm -hmm. that one has to go on the list. And I guess we can put Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man run on the list as well seems that appropriate i think had a, had a huge impact yeah uh, i will also put gi joe on the list because nice. that a gi joe comic was the first comic i ever purchased with my own money when i nice. rode down to the convenience store and loved the toys so i bought a comic yeah. and uh there's actually some really good stories in that you know the larry hama run which was pretty much the whole series, the Marvel series of GI Joe. Yeah. So I will put GI Joe on the list. Yeah. Um, oh boy. Oh boy. Memoirs of an angel. This Oh gosh. Stop an it. Unknown <laughs> creator. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't read that trash. That'll warp your mind. Oh, it's, it's amazing stuff. <laughs> it should be on everyone's top five list. Um, I will put um, the the Wolverine when the Wolverine solo comic first came out. Not the not the Frank Miller miniseries, but the um, just the ongoing series came out. Yeah, it was I think that was written by Larry Hama from the beginning as well. See, I've actually never read that run because my first introduction to the solo Wolverine was Frank Miller's miniseries. It's great too. Yeah. But the yeah. monthly had John Lucim art, who was at that time, I was, that was becoming one of my art heroes too, because, you know, he did the how to draw comics, the Marvel way. Yeah. But what you I mean, did. Stan Lee didn't do that. Stan <laughs> Lee was the inspiration and he wrote all the words. But, yeah. yeah. No, it was, um, yeah, John Buscema. I, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. Or not. You know what? Yeah, it's a safe place. It's fine. But, uh, <laughs> so I'll throw that on there because I love that. It was entertaining and uh, great art. And uh, number last five, one. Last one. Um, man, I'm trying to think of something more recent that I. I'll say the Justice League International, like the, nope, scratch it. I've got it. Craven's, it la Craven's Last Hunt. Dude, the yes. J.M., uh, De Matisse, Mike Zek, Spider-Man story was, that was another one that, um, just kind of shocking in a way. You know, it's like, yeah. You're used to Spider, you know, Spider Man always had his drama, but this was like this dude killing himself and spoiler alert, creating characters. <laughs> Jeremy, um, does, Jeremy won't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a heavy story, but it was it was so good. It was so good. So yeah, I'll I'll definitely throw that. And that was spread over like I think there was like four different Spider Man titles running at the time. So there yeah. was like you know, went through that um the arc of the story, went through all all four of those um because that's how they titles, get you ladies and gentlemen you got to get all the different titles to get the story i wish they only did it through four titles <laughs> now, now yeah like, man it's like every book we it. publish you have right. to buy this month yeah all 57 of them you yeah. gotta buy it so um actually yeah, so, that's not very much of an exaggeration it was 52 there for a while with dc yeah no it's yeah. not exaggerated they these yeah. crossovers are you know, unless you buy almost every book 
the com- the publisher will put out in a month. You can't. You can't really keep up. I mean, you can. You well, can fill in the gaps, you but messed up. Yeah. Yeah, if you're a, you know, kind of an OCD perfectionist, then mm. it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> yeah. Then you're poor. This one. Then you're poor. <laughs> then you're very poor. That is true. Yeah, yeah with happens. the rebirth stuff with DC, like I really got into it. I was like, I'm doing yeah. it this time. Like, you know, I was like, because I loved the first. Uh, um, the 80 page, you know, one sh- or the intro that they did where Wally comes back. Um, and it, like, it was brilliant. It was so good. I cried when Barry, you know, recognized Wally. I was like, Oh, this is, <laughs> this is so great. And then I found out that I was literally going to have to buy like 10 books a week <laughs> for, you know, the rest of my life to keep up with this series. I was like, well, that was a good 80 page story. I'm yeah. done because I don't have that kind of money. Because um, even then, even sometimes then they'll go on like a bi-monthly uh, or bi-weekly, I guess. Yeah. A publishing schedule where you have to buy the same title. Yeah. But DC, times D- a month. DC was a Trixie Hobbit because they were like, <laughs> oh, we'll lower the price. But then they like doubled the amount of books that they had. <laughs> So yeah. it's like, and like, like they came out like twice a month, like you said, but it's like, it's only a dollar. I'm yeah. like, well, yeah, but it's the same price that it would have been otherwise. They saw you coming. A they mile did. Away. They did. Absolutely. Well, so, um, so Sir Beezer, we, yeah. uh, we yes. have explored all of your, uh, your favorite comics and you kind of dipped into the next question already. Um, which is, uh, you know, kind of telling us your, your story, how you got into comics. So you, you, you were into comics when you were a, a, a tiny Beezer and then you, you went on a bike trail and forgot about them. And then you came back when you saw Todd McFarlane, spider It's a magical bike trail. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so, so, but what point, at what point there or, or around, you know, at what point in your life did you realize, Hey, creating comics, this is, this is my gig. This is my thing. Well, I guess I must have found another magical bike trail because I forgot about it again, you know, like yeah. No. You, you had like a flirtatious love love out of love with comics your whole life, I see. It's kind of like the mafia, you know, you just when you figure out they pull you back in, you know. <laughs> but um yeah, I you know, I got out of them again whereas I would still casually read, but I wasn't excited about, you know, like when I when you fall back into love with with the comics and the art and the stories and everything and then if you've kind of got this inclination to tell stories which i've i had even a kid because i would lay on the floor and just draw on stacks of notebook paper kind of sequential stories you know yeah. stick figures but so i always like to tell stories um and draw but yeah it kind of faded away again but then about 10 years ago, what year is it now? Oh, it's, <laughs> it's 2020. Okay. Probably about uh, 11 years ago. I, you know, I've been drawn, I've been doing some art, but I was just not very serious about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, it just hit me that I love doing this and I should do more of it. You know, I mean, that sounds kind of simplistic, but you know, when you're, just kind of moving through every day working and then you don't have a passion that you're, that you're following. It's, it's just very uh, bland, you know, yeah. like what, what reason am I, am I here for? Like, that's, you know, I don't want to get too deep. Or stuff. But really, it, I mean, but, there is a, there is something to that though, you know, like, there is. cause you, there's every story you tell is a piece of you that you know you want to share that's inside that you want to share it with other people um and let me put my stories in you indeed indeed <laughs> and and yeah it is though like it gives it gives you that purpose like it you know because you're an artist you're a creator yeah you want to express yourself in some way and that's you know if if you're an artist you do it with pictures and drawings so <laughs> drawings. the drawings, drawings. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah, I, 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 I kind of started doing some painting again. And then, you know, I had these characters that I created when I was a kid. And I'm like, I, I want to do a comic. But I didn't use those characters at first. I did a zombie comic book. It was called Zombie Truckers. 
Yes. Awesome. And uh, it was going to be a four issue limited series, and I did one issue, and I'm like, uh, I'm done with zombies. Yeah, I'm done. With <laughs> yeah. I was kind of ahead of the curve on the whole Walking Dead thing, but oh, so what? What year did you put out your zombie comic then? Uh, it was 2008. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the comic was still going, but you know, uh, yeah, but then, the show hadn't picked up really. Yet. Yeah, that wasn't really into it because it, it wasn't really what I. It was just kind of a kitschy idea mm. that I had for Zombie Trucker, and it's still a pretty good idea with the different stories I had. I think anyway, but. I just wasn't into it. So that kind of fell by the wayside. So I'm like, let me do something with these characters that um, I kind of created with my friends when I was a kid. And they're not the same, but they, the basis is there, you know, and they kind of morphed. And so that's when I uh, started working on um, astounding tales, rooftops, all the different names is known by because I can't decide (laughs) <laughs> before i launch these things eh, i probably shouldn't call it this because that's nobody can find that or whatever yeah. But, um yeah that's when i started working on that and that came out in 2010 the first issue of uh, astounding tales yeah so so like at what moment do you, like can you pinpoint like was there like a like a just a moment where the light bulb went off like, were you like in the middle of work and you were like, F this, I'm making comics. <laughs> like, well, you know, like, like, was there that like a moment? Was it? Every F-U, day. F-U, <laughs> F-U. F-U. Yeah, it was F you. You're cool. I'm making com- oh, did I say that out loud? I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was just kind of, yeah, I mean, you know, working at a, I was in a call center at the time and it was. Oh, my yeah. condolences. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it was either suicide or make comics. So I. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I got back into art and uh, just really went at it full bore, you know, just from the time I got home till way too late in the <laughs> evening, you know, yeah. working on just practicing and putting the story together and then drawing the pages. And it just evolved until, um, you know, and through this time I'm learning how am I going to publish this comic and where, you know, how do I get it printed and yeah, everything I want to do. So, I mean, it was just, you know, I'm not a trailblazer as far as being on the front end of, you know, indie publishing or things. I kind of had to wait until the waters were tested and things mm-hmm. were, you know, things were safe to get in. I'm like, okay, I can do this now because in the nineties, when I was much younger and I, uh, you know, fresh out of, um, the swamp and just crawled fresh out, out the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> I just pulled myself up onto the shore. Um, yeah. I was going to make a comic and I had actually called a, uh, a printing local printing company. And we talked, I talked with the guy on the phone and it was <laughs> set up a meeting because they just, couldn't get the concept of a comic book Yeah, as I was talking to him on the phone. So I'm, I met with this guy and a couple other fellas from the printing shop and they were looking at, I brought them a comic book to look at the dimensions and see how it's done. And they're looking at it like uh, the apes from, <laughs> you know, like it's a fire for the first time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh. Oh, or like, like from Zoo- Zoolander. Yeah. 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 Exactly. In the, in computer, the computer 2001 here? A Space Odyssey or whatever. So, yeah, they're like, oh, well, this is a very special uh, print job. So the price was just astronomical. Oh, because, yeah. Of course, this was before um, digital on-demand printing. So any type of print run was going to have to be in the thousands. Yeah. Anyway, for them to even consider doing it. Man. And then the price was well more than than i could uh ten dollars per book it's like what <laughs> at least yeah yeah so i mean i've got a lot of respect for you know the guys like uh dave sims and all those guys who did independent publishing in the 70s and 80s because yeah. it, it was not easy i'll tell you it was to get all your your printing jobs in order and get everything distributed because yeah i mean 
you had two distributors back then. It was like Diamond and uh, Capital City, maybe. That sounds right. Diamond ate them up anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, they didn't last. Yeah, Yeah, so. But, um, so yeah, and then you had to sink all the money into advertising and in those books. And, you know, that's no guarantee comic shops are going to buy this comic. So, yeah, that was one of the things that kind of, you know. Yeah, that's why when people like me out of it for a while. Yeah, when people use like uh, the Ninja Turtles story as like a you know like oh yeah like I'm just gonna do that I was like that never happens yeah, that, that happened that, literally one time and yeah. that was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yeah. like it, and that that does not happen like but it's true like they had to go like find a printer to print a comic because there yeah. weren't indie printers then like you didn't have like nobody printed comics except for like <laughs> the big companies yeah. um so yeah like i i've watched like a few documentaries about like how they got started and their process and i was like that is like i'm so thankful that i i i, I that we live in right now where <laughs> you know like with technology and there's so many things that that have opened the doors uh, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Like, yeah, you don't even have to actually print them now. Yeah, you don't. You yeah. can just literally like, which, which somebody's doing that with, oh, uh, who with could a theory. Who could it be? <laughs> uh, jokes on you. I'm gonna print that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was so. The story's kind of incohesive because. Pulp Fiction, and you know, I keep jumping back and forth in time. It's all back <laughs> to Pulp Fiction. Yeah. So, 2010, you know, I did digital printing, and which is great because you can get one issue printed, or you can get a thousand printed, and the price yeah. is reasonably the same. So, yeah. um, launched that, you know, started, um, you know, peddling it to shops around town and selling in it uh before i even started doing conventions i started doing you know things like uh street festivals and fall festivals and stuff so and it was great there because nobody else was selling comic books at those and comic book art you know i'm i'm in a row of like candles and wind chimes and (laughs) soap and crochet and then right oh here's some stupid pictures yeah well, I remember when I was a kid, like there was, there was a guy who, who set up, he had comic esque, there weren't comic books, but they were essentially like comics, uh, and, and, and paintings and stuff of this world, this fantasy world that he created at St. James art fair. Mm-hmm. And my mom, just like, you know, she would go to all like the quilts and all these things. And I would just like run off and stay the whole time, just like bugging this guy, sure. uh, which I'm sure it's like, either my, that or the corn dog, you know? Right, so, yeah, so, which I also frequented as right. well. Right, yeah. corn dogs are great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can't get a good one unless you're at, you know, a event like that. So. Indeed. So yeah, so like those kind of like street festival things, like that's a great place uh, to camp out. So, um, so yeah, like um, when, so when did you like start really getting into the Comic Con scene? I think it was 2011. I think I think I feel like that was the first year for Derby City. Mm. Comic Con, because I've been going to conventions um, and even showing my portfolio at like New York and C2E2 and yeah. places. But I wasn't exhibiting. Um, but when you know, I found out about Derby City, I emailed Eric, the guy who started it, as soon as I found out about it. And I'm like, anything, any help you need, whatever. Yeah. I'm will, because I wanted it to be a success. I wanted it to just. You know, I mean, this is a convention in my town, which we've yeah. never had, you know, when I was a kid, there would be a, com- a comic convention was, a, you know, a subroom of the Ramada off the <laughs> off the interstate where it's just right. a few comic book stores have 10 long boxes of quarter comics, which I love. As a kid. Yeah. I love going and getting some cheap comic books. It was a great time, but it's not a comic convention as we think of it today right right yeah nobody dressed up there was no cosplay there oh, were no I dressed celebrities. Up, <laughs> nobody nobody appreciated it right yeah it just me in pajamas and cowboy boots <laughs> but um so uh yeah I, derby city con was the first actual comic convention that 
um, that I did. And then from there, it just, you know, it, it kind of became more, like I said, I'm not a trailblazer or anything. So I have to do these things in comfortable, small increments. So here was a comic yeah. I mentioned in my town that was reasonably priced as far as getting a table. So there wasn't a lot of risk involved in it. So, you know, just then I started taking steps and going further and further out to conventions, you know, and then, you know, eventually I'm doing C2E2 and, you know, Indianapolis and Cincinnati and Lexington and um, doing multiple conventions a year, which I miss, you know, this year is going yes. Oh, uh, I can't yeah. wait to get back. It's going to yeah. be great. Cause even, you know, I've never been at a bad comic convention. You know, there's, there's ones where probably aren't selling as much as you'd like. And there's probably not as much traffic as you'd like as far as interacting <laughs> with people. But even the worst ones are still a blast. You know, you always have a great time at a, at a comic convention. So yeah, yeah, this is, that's a huge casualty of this year. Mm. It really is. Cause like our first comic con that uh, me and Robin did, um, we like our very, very first one. It was the first year that, that this, that this city did, um, the city that we were in did their first comic con. They didn't really know what they were doing, unfortunately. And like the only comic store in the town didn't even know what was happening. And it was just, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was really poorly put together. <laughs> And so, like, I mean, maybe that's Somerset, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe 200 people showed up that day and it was the only year they did it. It just that's pretty good for absolutely no advertising. Well, they did (laughs) advertise, but it was like they advertised in weird ways. So I I just think they just probably didn't really yelling out the window. (laughs) Hey, Hey. we got comics. Comic Con next Saturday. Yeah. Come on. (laughs) Uh, But um, but but even that show, like I I met some of my friends now that are at different comic cons. Like, you know, I met, um, uh, our former guest on the show, um, Ray Kaufman. We yeah, met I there. watched, I watched your yeah. podcast with, uh, oh, with well, him on it. Yeah. Indeed. Mm. Thank you. Sir. He's a good guy. Yeah. 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 Ray's great. And so like, you know, I, I, you know, we met there and, and we've become really good friends and, and so like, even that, even at a show where like, you don't really have anybody coming through the door, we sold like the only books we sold were really the ones that like, someone another creator took pity on us and you know gave us a couple bucks. fine yeah it's like i'll do it whatever and the rest of it like we just <laughs> At traded least they didn't trade but... well we did that too that was most of it so but we ne- it was networking it, it was networking it was really just making friends hanging out with people it's really yeah. and you call it networking whatever but like that's that was successful because that was our first one and we had no idea what to expect and so it was low key and we got to meet some really cool people. And like I said, they've just become, you know, we see them all the time now at different comic cons. So, yeah, I, I cannot wait until we can get back yep. to that on the regular. Yeah, me too. But who so, knows? Who knows geez. when it shall be? Who knows? Maybe it'll all be virtual from now on. Uh, I got a bunch of conventions. I'm already just keep rolling over from year to year. Yeah, like. I know, right. I already paid for it. So yeah. just, uh, yeah, the whole year's paid for. <laughs> I, so. I bought rage against the machine tickets like almost a year and a half ago <laughs> for the, it was going to be this summer oh. and, and they, uh, rescheduled it once and then like have postponed it. So, no, and, I mean, they were like, $250 tickets like yeah you know when crazy good tickets and I'm have just they like, reunited just for this tour or yeah are yeah they gonna make other I don't know if they're gonna make any more music and this may all fizzle out they may not even do the thing now like I don't I don't know so many people are having those like conversations about like well do we even do this do we want to do this anymore do we yeah. keep yeah. like cramming our schedule <laughs> to like you know make up all these shows so yeah i don't know well that's something uh phil phil back and i have talked about is what if uh what if comic cons don't come back the same way they you know like what if yeah 
just what if they can't happen anymore? You know, like even after the, the pandemic is over and things kind of return to normal, like what if just so many people have either lost the means to do it or lost interest to do it, or so many uh, shops and vendors have gone into other areas of business to, to survive mm, during the yep. pandemic. Like what, and, and I truly believe they will come back and it, yeah. it may take uh, two or three years to get back up to steam the way, the way things were, but um, yeah, it's kind of uh, sad and harrowing thoughts to think about, you know, that, yeah. the, I mean, that's, you know, for independent creators, that's a, that's a huge um, part of our, I won't say livelihood, but I mean, that's how you keep your, keep your vision growing, you know, well, it's, it's also how you meet, new new readers and, right and, you know, right yeah, you that's, get out that's there how you and, yeah if you don't get out there and meet those people then you're probably going to lose interest in right and then at that point stuff. you're your only your only option is to just be do it all on social media and digitally which which has its place absolutely like that yeah. i think this year has definitely shown us we can still do quite a bit of you know getting together and things like that through things like zoom through and and i know a lot of comic cons went virtual this year and did kind of a setup like this like they had panels they did you know interviews with creators and so like the people who follow that that comic con watched it and then you know they were able to to go to this the store option on the uh, on the uh website and all that stuff so there is they, they they were very creative this year uh but you how missed they this- did it you miss the smells of the con. Right? But <laughs> Absolutely. You, 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 it makes you just want to run around with the humid <laughs> smells of the comic con floor <laughs> and the mouth breathing, you yeah. know, just the, yeah. Um, no, but like, but, but in all seriousness though, you do miss the, the hustle and bustle feel of there's know. nothing, there's nothing like, you know, as a creator, there's nothing like walking into a comic con um before ever you know as all the other creators are getting there and oh yeah in the morning and everybody's you know drinking their coffee grumbling yeah. to each yeah, other good morning and, yeah why am i doing this <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and there's just it's 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 a it's a great feeling especially yeah. like that saturday morning and everybody's like all right here it is it's either it's either now or nothing so uh but no it's just yeah. I, I it's a it's an experience unlike any other i think it is i miss it i miss it a yeah. lot Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, things have changed uh, incredibly. Like, I, I don't know that the world is going to be uh, ever be the same again. You know, I think you, yeah, th- I think, you it's... think about like, uh, you know, see like um, videos of people in like China and Japan and things like that. And everybody's walking around with a face mask on. And that seems so foreign until now. You're like, what? yeah. Why, why are they all doing that? Like, you just didn't make any sense to you. And now it's like, that's probably what our normal is going to be for the next several years. Right. Like yeah. you've got companies making fancy masks that are stylish and they have yeah. cool cartoon pictures on there. And it's just like, yeah. this is so weird. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. you know, putting cheese on your broccoli to get your kids to eat it. Or it was like, please, yeah. 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 Please don't die. Yeah, look, here's your favorite sports ball team. Put it on your face. Yeah. I cut this cauliflower in the shape of a dinosaur. Please yeah. be healthy. Just yeah. have pity and do it, please. Oh. Yeah, things have changed a lot. What what has been the the biggest change in the in the indie scene since you started? Because you we just talked, you know, been 10, 11 years since you first got into it. Yeah, how COVID, you... COVID aside, like not, yeah, yeah, and yeah, not twenty twenty. Right. We're not yeah, talking. Don't about ask that. me what's yeah. changed this year. Yeah, yeah, no, no. We'll just do over next year. Um, I would, I would say that there is just the the amount and number of alleys and avenues you can take to get to where you want to go, mm-hmm. as far as whether it's social different platforms of social media where you want to put your art and kind of promote yourself or advertise or just try to interact with people to get your art, your story out, or whether it's going to, 
I mean, there's so many more conventions than there were even yeah. 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. Uh, there was one year in Louisville where we had four different comic type conventions, you know, pop mm -hmm. culture type conventions. So and now we um, have one. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I don't know if they do Arcade Expo again. Oh, yeah. Our, That's well, like the only one we have. I think they will, but um, yeah. maybe not next It's year. a pretty good show. I've, it's a great show. I yeah, love Arcade yeah, Expo. Yeah, I've not, I've, not, uh, I've not been an exhibitor, uh, but I've been. It's really it's really fun. It's a fun show. Like, I've yeah. been lucky enough to, like, do their art form on the yeah. badges and posters and stuff, and I've had a table there the last four or five years, and it's that show's very unique because it goes till midnight you know yeah. you're it's it's a super long day but it's it's fun you know there's people coming through and there there's a lot of cosplay there too and um that's a good convention yeah. but yeah um yeah so number of conventions is another thing there's just um and not just comic conventions but like i, I mentioned earlier the art festivals and street fairs and things like that there's a lot of pop-up events like that, things to where if you kind of think out of the box, you can get a booth and it might not cost you a whole lot. And you can, you know, meet a few people who, who are interested in, in what you're doing. Yeah. So a lot of options like that. Um, also, I mean. And I think you can also like, you have to like play that game because you were talking before, you know, about going to uh, the like street fair or something and you being the only person right. selling comics, you know, you can, you can like really hit that bullseye. If you get, if you get the like right ratio, you know what I mean? You don't want to be oh, for sure. drown out like at a comic book sh shop or whatever, but you also don't want to be like the only guy. Cause people are just going to be like, well, what is this weird guy? <laughs> Who's right? this weirdo? But I think you <laughs> I can like, it doesn't matter where it's at. I'm going to yeah. get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a, a good idea at those at those type of shows is to not just have your comic book art, but if you've done other types of art, paintings or you know non comic book type stuff, to throw that in the mix too. So mm -hmm. there's um, you know because probably not a majority of the people there are comic book fans walking through, but they right. might be art fans. So something else might catch their eyes. Yeah. But, um, yeah. The other, the other thing I was going to say, as far as things that have changed is we've, we've talked about digital on demand printing. Some, mm -hmm. yeah. there's so many more printing options now, as far as, I mean, from, from comics to stickers to, um, I mean, everything you want to sell at a convention, basically, it's it's pretty easy to get printed up anymore, you know. Yeah. So there's, it's just a lot easier um, to find than it than it was a few years ago. And um, I think of some um, printing companies that I use that, you know, I would get prints made through or um, cards or pamphlets, and now they all have comic book options and they're printing, you know, so, yeah. you know, will that bust at some point where they're like, eh, it's not worth it to do yeah. this. Or is it, you know, how much does it have to do with the popularity of the Marvel cinematic universe and uh, comic books have exploded and trade paperbacks, but you got to ride the wave while you can, I guess. And yeah. And I think it's also smart, like as a creator, to really pay attention to where indie creator indie comics and things are booming mm -hmm. and find a printer there. Yeah. Um, Cause like we print out of a company in Michigan um, and um, like Michigan is like the spot like Michigan, like Northern Ohio, that whole little cluster of area. Like, I don't know how many people I've met at comic cons, or like indie creators and I walk up like, Oh, where are you from? Michigan or, you know, that the, around that area, upper Ohio. And I'm like, good grief. Well, there's so, the, um, it's not the small press expo. What, what is the one in, um, I think it's in Columbus. I can't remember. It's, it's not so much a comic con as it's more like, you know, an independent creator, 
to space or something like that. I can't remember. I can't. I don't. I don't think but I've been to that one. I no, I haven't been to it either. Okay, but I've, yeah. I've heard good things about. It, but it's not necessarily my type of you know genres. You know, where I'm afraid yeah. they'll look at me like, "Get out of here, superhero boy!" Sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. What are uh, you doing with your life? That's not a zine. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You didn't stable that yourself. Oh gosh! Sorry. What? The, where's the leather bound rope? You know, <laughs> rope. This bound. wasn't bound by hand. Yes, indeed. <laughs> leather bound rope. Yeah, you know. Interesting. Uh, I'm yeah, going yeah, a different direction now. Yeah, this is this not that kind of party. You've been uh, beezered. <laughs> You've been beezered. Get the there rope. It is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, um. So Stephen, the uh, you you are you are an anomaly in a lot of ways <laughs> as a creator, as a comic creator specifically, yeah. because you do um, pretty much everything yourself for your comics, right? You you uh, you do the art, you color, you or you do the line work, you color, you do the lettering, um, and uh, and you write the scripts as well. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So walk us through that process, like how like. You're sitting down, you know, you, you've got an idea. Walk us through the process of that initial idea to the completed page. You got a whole lot to lose there. I mean, like, because if it sucks, <laughs> there's nobody that you can blame. You know what right. I mean? Like, exactly. Oh, my, my writer. What, I found what you can editor. blame them and then just not tell people that it was you. Just you made up people. Is? Yeah. I don't know how many times I'm drawing and I'm like, oh, I curse this writer. He's a yeah. terrible person making me Freaking draw cards. Kevin. <laughs> that's i have thought about several times and you know i may do it going forward but like giving a different name to every aspect of my personality it's doing the different oh there you go it's like jobs use your, yeah use your multiple personality disorder i might get yeah you know stephen bowman might be writing it but stephen beezer's drawing the thing <gasps> yeah sir 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 dingo beezer <laughs> he does he's the editor he's, the editor. he's the editor <laughs> <laughs> but um no it's a uh, I mean, for me, it's since I've always created stuff that way because, you know, I had friends that liked comic books, but they didn't have any interest in drawing or coloring or doing anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was I was always doing the, the creative chores when I was a kid when we were making stories. But um, so now it's not so much that I, I love doing it all because I I don't, I don't like, <laughs> I don't like the lettering. I'm not really a, a big fan of my, my colors because um, I feel like someone else could do it so much better that has a, you know, a much better eye for color. And um, you would also, you know, make the process a lot faster too, but <laughs> I, I can't, you know, for the, for this to, for me to do it and, be able to produce more and more. I can't afford to pay someone what they right. deserve because I don't, I don't want to like haggle with someone to get the lowest price they're willing to go to do this because as yeah. a creator myself, I, I hate that feeling when, yeah. you know, somebody's just trying to get you to your bare minimum of, of what you, what you will go for your, to do for your art. Right. So yeah. I don't, I don't want to, um, short change someone on paying them. So that's why, that's why I do the things myself. It's not because I think I'm great at, or I love doing it. I am just cheap and I don't want to, <laughs> um, shell out that money to have a professional job done, which I, I would love to do. But, um, yeah. at this point where I'm at right now, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a one man show. You know, if, if somebody, um, you know, if I, if I could find somebody who's like, like an intern, you know, that's what I yeah, need. I need yeah, an intern, need an like intern. <laughs> just a team of interns to, oh, you, you want to learn how to do comics? I can, and, and folks, you can to, learn it really crappy, you yeah, know, but uh, folks to apply for the, the, <laughs> the number on your screen. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a scrolling number below. Uh, just go to intern dot biz mm -hmm. and um, you will be able to fill out your application. Um, yeah. to the to the lowest paying job you've ever had yeah, there we for, go for me to pair with uh, another negative. creator it would, you it have, would to really have to it. be yeah it would have to be a labor of love for everyone yeah. and, and yeah. the thing about your personal projects is other people don't 
they may enjoy your project, but they don't have that. It's not their baby, but it's yeah, your, they don't have yeah, that yeah. burning desire to do it. So I, I can't expect another person to be invested in, you know, to the level I am. So. Right. No, I get that for sure. So when you, so when you like, do you, do you as a, as a writer, when you put on your writer's hat, do you like write a bunch of notes uh, and then write a full <laughs> script or do you just go straight to the drawing board and you're like, I'm just, you know, chaotic writing stuff down as you draw. Yes. <laughs> Rad. All of that. Excellent. <laughs> I love it. Um, no, it, it's, I, I wish I could say that I have a very structured approach to my writing and I meditate in the morning with a sage <laughs> candle and, and I shower and think about the cause. No, it's just chaos. It's like yeah. sometimes I have fully formed scene in my head with dialogue that is just playing over and over in my head, kind of like a movie. And I just yeah. see it. It's moving from panel to panel and I can just sit down and draw that. Yeah. But there's a lot of times a story I don't, whereas when I start a story, I have a start. And have an end. Yeah. And I know a few things that have to happen in the middle, but a lot of the times story's kind of telling itself to me yeah. mm -hmm. at the same time, because I'm not sure what everything is going to happen from this point to this point. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you, you know, and I think that's really important to have, like, I love that you said that it's very important as a creator, I think to have a beginning. Well, obviously, but, and then plan an end. I oh, think. yeah. yeah I think that, because, I mean, some people critical. will just be like, they're just like, whatever, I'm going to end it whenever I want to. But, like, it's so hard to end a good story. Uh, I mean, you look at, you know, amazing shows like Game of Thrones and the ending of that show made a lot of people mad. And yeah. other people enjoyed it. But, but I think that's so important. But it's interesting that, like, that you've got, like, you kind of have little little dots that you would follow that bring you through the story and the rest of it's just kind of left up for fun as you, right. as you go. Yeah. That's why I like use... lost. That, yeah. Like that's lost. another one I thought of. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Lost. Yeah. I, I think about that ending before. I just scratched my head the whole time. Like, <laughs> like what, what is why? happening? My friend, my buddy, my good, my dear friend, Evan, try, he loved lost and he, he loves the ending. He just does. He's an idiot. And, and he just, he's a sucker for it. And so he's trying to get me. Cause I knew, I knew that I didn't watch the show and I was going to watch it after it was over just binge it. And then I heard that the ending sucked and he was like, no, he's like, and he tried to explain it to me. And I was like, that sounds like it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I can't like, that just sucks. I can't get into that ending. And if I know an ending sucks, I'm not going to watch the show. So. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you have to have a plan. Um, and the thing that popped into my head as we were talking about it is, is the newest star Wars trilogy, which, mm. you know, I don't hate, but I definitely saw through the course of those three movies, they didn't have a cohesive plan when they started. It was pretty obvious. Yeah. yeah. It kind of like a lot of things were set up and talked about. And then the next movie was like <laughs> something else, <laughs> nothing. And then the third movie, it's like, Oh, here's this. Yeah. It explains that. Right. Maybe, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah, like what happened to the little boy with the broom? Oh, he's you, still you know what I'm sweeping. talking about? He's just yeah, yeah. he's still sweeping, yes, yeah. stables. He's using yeah. the force to sweep now, though. So, yeah, no, a lot of the stuff that was in that Ray's vision in the first movie you think is gonna and then they never touch pan on it. out and then yeah. nothing, but yeah, so you have to have. Some people are more detailed and they'll want every meticulous detail planned out from start to finish. But mm -hmm. I like to have a little wiggle room in the middle if I want to take something out or want to add something or um, things just go a different direction. But yeah, you, you definitely have to have an ending point. Um, otherwise, you will. The biggest risk you run is never finishing. Yeah that story if you don't have a definite <clears throat> stopping point in your mind yeah it, it may never you may never have that drive to get it done mm -hmm. if you yeah. don't plan that out and write it in stone in your 
in your brain tablet, at least. <laughs> you know, chipping away in your brain yeah. tablet. So as far as writing it, like I said, it's it's just uh, a collection of every technique you would mm-hmm. think of as a writer. There's I've got envelope, you know, bills with the envelopes that I've got notes scribbled on and I just, that's the closest thing handy. I write that there and then I put that in a stack of notes that I have to go through later. Yeah. There's notes on my the memo on my phone. There's, you know, pictures that I drew that I liked. And I'm like, Oh, I'll put this character here, you know, right down. So yeah, it's, it's whatever works for you really. I mean, if you can stay somewhat organized and by organized, keep everything in the same room, you know, or <laughs> right. you know, it's in this room. You might have to dig through a bunch of stacks of stuff, but you know, that information is here. Yeah. Then, uh, you, yeah, I don't like pull it back together. Mike Mignola has like three filing cabinets in his studio where like, he'll just, if he's just like sitting there and an idea comes to him, he'll like write it down and he'll, he'll like, you know, go and, or if he's like, Oh yeah, I, I wanted to do this with a certain story, he'll like rummage through all his filing cabinets of ideas and Mm. pull stuff out. So I always thought that was really interesting. I don't have room for filing cabinets. So I just use Google Google docs. Mm. (laughs) I, I I use that as well. I don't use it. uh, Probably as organized as, as I should, because there's notes from different stories altogether. I'm like, what? This doesn't (laughs) make any sense. Everything's untitled final version. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like that great idea you wake up with in the middle of the night and you're like, like ah. and you just scribble it down and two, you know, two weeks later you find this note that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Is this even English? What's <laughs> happening? I guess it, if it, I always tell myself it was a, such a great idea. It was meant to be. I would have remembered it. So Yeah. Yeah. As it was at Mitch Hedberg who said that if he thought of a joke in the middle of the night and his pen and pad were across the room, he had, and he didn't feel like getting up. He just convinced himself the joke wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It wasn't meant to be. So that's my writing process. It's just everything. And then I'll uh I'll do some layouts once I move to the once I feel the story is is scripted out to where and as far as scripting, I'll I'm usually pretty loose with um with the scripting because I know it's gonna change a little bit once I start actually drawing and and writing the actual you know laying out the panels and everything because mm-hmm. i don't plan ahead my panels and how much dialogue should be you know curved around this that, guy's head yes so, that is such I'm, a trick right so there I'm like, well i guess he's not saying that in this panel i want to <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna say that on the next page you know, right yeah so do you do like thumbnails and stuff like that then mm-hmm. okay yeah. cool i'll uh it's just usually on a piece of scratch paper. I'll make two, basically two, turn it landscape and make two little pages and start laying out my thumbnails and panels and uh, nice. getting an idea of where, what dialogue goes where. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, then I'll start penciling and uh, go to the inks, go to the colors and it's just a long process that you just kind of, you know how it is. You just got to kind of, yeah. you have to wade, you have to, wade through it every night till you get to the <laughs> yeah. other shore, you know? Yeah. And, and honestly, like for me, and I don't know if this is the same way with you. Um, like I honestly have to just like kind of like just put on different mindsets, like a different hat for each uh, job. Like I will sit down and write the entire script before I start drawing anything like that yeah. for me, like that just helps separate it all out. So like I can like put on my writer's hat, I'm a writer for a week or two and I write the whole thing out. And then, you know, I put that away. Of course, I'm always kind of coming back and write notes and stuff, but like for a specific issue, I'm done writing it. It's edited. And then when it gets back, you know, from the editors, I sit down at my tablet and I, I kind of sketch out. I don't actually do thumbnails, which I, I did with the last issue that I did, but I normally don't. I will normally just kind of, I'll, I'll type out all the description 
like how mm. you know how I know what I want the panel to look like. I'll just type it all out, and hopefully I remember <laughs> what that visual <laughs> was. And but I'll just go straight to the drawing tablet and sketch it out as I'm there. Um, and so it's I, very. I think that's that speaks more to your um, completeness as a writer. Whereas, whereas if you've written a scene in your head, you can kind of visualize it better, yeah. you know, from your writing. Yeah. Whereas me, where I'm kind of a hybrid, you know, or half breed <laughs> artist writer, I kind of, that kind of melds into one action where I have to um, think about the scene and the panel and what angle, you know, all, all the different, you know, things that I think about where I'm, when I'm designing a, a page and a sequence, cause I kind of think of it as a movie in my head. I'm like, where do I want the camera one up here? Do I want it down here? But that, that usually doesn't happen in my, so, some scenes it does. I have a yeah. very clear vision when I'm writing it of, I want it from this angle. I want it over this shoulder. I want it, you know, this person here and this person here. But a lot of that usually takes place when I'm doing my thumbnails where I kind of, Hmm. shake all that out gotcha that's that's a cool okay so that's a really cool difference so you yeah you you essentially just do all your so i'm just writing my thumbnails <laughs> it's really what it what it's what it all is what it sounds like yeah <laughs> yeah oh, See, I'll, I'll write mostly you know dialogue and if there's no dialogue in that next panel as i'm as i'm right now i'm thinking okay this happens next after he says this you know, she's going to do this. Then I'll yeah. write in the script. So and so picks up the hammer. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I don't. Um, I don't do a lot of the uh, angles and you know the particulars of of the scene until I get to the layouts, and then I start putting that all together. Nice. Cool. Nice. <laughs> But then also as as a visual visual based individual, you know, I kind of just put those things together. Um, not haphazardly, but I kind of I do it with thought, but at first I, I have to get something down and then I can kind of rearrange it to where I like. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I can, there's a, I can there's a lot of on. yeah, there's a lot of editing at that point of the thumbnail. So you might go through two or three thumbnails mm -hmm. for a page before. Okay, that's where I want it. That's that's yeah. it right there. Which, again, going back to thinking it was like a movie. You know, sometimes you you think you know the scene you want, but then after you record it and watch it back. Like now let's do another take and you move this yeah. person over here and you do it a little bit different. So it's, it's a journey. It's a, it's a journey on my bicycle <laughs> through a trail. <laughs> but as far as the, the separate things of penciling, inking is as far as what you said is like, I got my writer cap on this week. Yeah. I'm writing. I do that with, you know, the, the art creation stage like, I don't want to start inking until I've got the pencils done because not only from a, God forbid, I have to go back and change, you know, a lot, make a lot of edits in the pencils, you know, before, right. you know, when I get to the end of the story, I'm like, Oh, I got to change a bunch of stuff, but hmm. it's more like a rhythm thing. Like, Oh, I got my, I've got my pencil technique going, you know, the, the line weights are just the way, you know, yeah. I've got my stroke tonight, you know. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> right. You walk, you like walk coming out the just the way daddy likes. You're like, oh yeah, tonight's yeah. a drawing night. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to break that rhythm and then start inking. And yeah. Um, and then once I get things done, then I go to color and then do the letters and all the design stuff. Cool. So, man, tell us about uh, Trash City. Uh, that's your your newest um creation um yep. we alluded to it before that is um the web comic 
So Web comic, I just launched it last uh, last well, whenever this comes out. I launched it on October thirtieth. Yeah, so, there you go. <laughs> um, so it's it's up on Webtoons. You search Trash City, and hopefully you can find it. <laughs> it I say that because you know I'm like, all right, this should there's nothing else called Trash City. This should be the first. On webtoon, it is so difficult to find stuff sometimes. Yeah, it is. It really. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why, man. but yeah. But it was like the other day, or I think Monday when I looked, it was like tenth down. Yeah. Of the, of the list after, in the canvas section, so um, maybe if you know it gets more subscribers and more views, maybe it goes up in the in the the results of where you search for that but yeah you can find it if you search for it on webtoons or my instagram um at steven beezer i've got a link in my bio um i need to get a link on my website too trash-city.com i can put a link i forgot all about that um yeah trash city is we kind of talked about before i've i've done superhero comics so Mm -hmm. this is a bit different from that and i wanted to take a break from I grew up loving superheroes and you know I love telling those stories but I want to I've got other stories you know I want to tell I'm not one to men, I don't want to be typecast as <laughs> a superhero artist yeah but um no I wanted to tell some more other stories and so I wanted to create a world where basically anything can be going on like Mm -hmm. you can have a skeleton talking to you know a guy in uh you know a cosmic suit i mean and you're like don't ask why it's just happening you know and that's one of the things i like about um you know in contrast to american comics um manga yeah is they'll throw weird characters in, and they never explain not a thing (laughs) why this character you know has a, a purse as a head, you know, yeah. or just looks completely different than all the other human characters or whatever. That you might get that backstory as to what they are mm-hmm. at some point, but if you did that in a lot of American comics, like like if you know a a talking teddy bear with a, a peg leg and an eye patch just walks into Avengers Mansion and everybody's interacting with there has to be three issues of who this <laughs> why why this teddy bear is the what you know how he can talk and why how he lost here. his leg exactly right. this all has to be done in great detail well i want to it's just there just just roll with it for me. just have some fun <laughs> throw your throw your questions away and just enjoy right but it, at some point you will learn things about that character and i'm talking about a character that's in trash city oh indeed yes the uh who will be in chapter two at the end of november i think Um, as far as concept design my favorite character so far is the mayor the mayor is trash uh, city he is uh he's a character all right he's uh (laughs) he's actually a demon but he's uh he's the mayor of trash city and trash city is It's called a lot of, it's in a place called different things by different people. Some people call it the spirit world, the afterlife. Uh Could just be an alternate dimension. It's a place where a lot of people end up after they spent some time on earth is how, is how we look at it. And trash city is a place where whatever energy you've surrounded yourself with and given out on earth, some people end up in trash city Mm -hmm. after they go there. And it's a lot of, most people don't want to be there, uh, which is the like the main character, Juniper Red Moon. She uh, in the first chapter, you kind of read about her um, motivations for wanting to get out of Trash City, which is she wants to go find her family hmm. who are not in Trash City, but she can't leave, and the mayor is kind of keeping her there, and uh, she runs a hot dog stand in trash city and has the best hot dogs in all of trash city. Just, I love hot dogs. I know, man. I, that's been so, so really quick. And we'll pick right back up with you. Yeah. Like th- you have been teasing this 
for like two years or longer yeah. at yeah. this point. And it's always the hot dogs and it's always the her with the hot dog stand. And I'm just like every, and I love, I have, I love hot dogs so much. Me so and every form, time, I mean. <laughs> like every time that I see it, I'm just like, I have to go eat a hot dog. And I've been waiting for this thing to come out. And I read issue one and folks, um, it's great. This is such an imaginative, creative world that you have, uh, you've you put together here man and i'm i'm stoked about it like i've been super excited when you announced that it was coming out on october 30th i freaked out like i told robin i was like no oh, it's here and um so yeah go go to webtoon and check it out uh because it is fantastic That's issue right. one is out right that. now yeah for sure man so so uh so keep sorry i interrupted you so keep no going. that was that was that was better than anything i could have said go read <laughs> i could tell you all about but just go read it and you'll yeah. find out in the uh as the adventure continues cool man well hey really really quick question about trisha then we'll, then yeah. we'll move on because we're, we're we're running out of time a little bit okay. um so if um what what was like what brought you to trash city like what was the initial concept <laughs> that, you know that made you decide to create it like did you were, well, were you like were you just tired of superhero stuff so you did this well it, it's 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 a few things yeah, I was, I'm not tired. Of, I'm still going to do more Astounding Tales stuff. I have to finish issue eight and then do the second trade. And that hopefully will be 2021. I yeah. Can that. But um, I still love that stuff, but I, I wanted to tell some other stories, like I said. And like, I'd be, I'd be at, at these conventions and shows and people come up to my table and have my Astounding Tales and like, what's this about? I'm like, well, it's a superhero. And, you know, you just see their face just like, Oh, superheroes, of course. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't get enough of that everywhere else. So I wanted to do something different, not only for myself, but, for you know, just to expand, you know, my audience and and just expand my own skills as a storyteller and also just have fun. Because, like I said, anything can anything can be drawn in this world, you know, so you know, monsters and robots and you know, Victorian era dresses, it's whatever, you know, whatever yeah. I feel like drawn can be in here, but um, Trash City just, <sighs> it was in a, a group text, it just kind of started with, you know, you know, Phil and Bruce, and yeah, yeah, we'd be like, to, like, did you see so-and-so artist on, you know, a famous artist on Instagram, where it is, like, they're, they're in Aspen, like dressed as Lloyd Christmas, like having right. champagne. I'm like, yeah, well, here I am in Trash City, just having hot dogs for breakfast and trying right. to get this drawing I'm doing for ten dollars done, you know, by noon or whatever. But <laughs> and it just kind of like, yeah, well, in Trash City, this is how we do it. You know, it just it just kind of evolved into from this concept of you know, as you're a, a sub, <laughs> you view yourself as like a a lower <laughs> lower level of whatever right. you're doing or yeah, you're, on the going to, you're on the street level of, of right Blade runner or you're in a place yeah. you don't other people don't want to be and you're right. just wallowing here you know you're in trash city so that's where it kind of grew out of and this character that um had in my in my head the the juniper redmond character you know who was going to be in astounding tales at you know in some form but i never found a home for her so yeah. she just kind of you know worked her way into trash city and that turned out to be the perfect home for her nice which i'll give you a spoiler Ooh, all my universes are connected <gasps> nice. i was about to ask i was like so like are you gonna have any kind of crossover event or anything and like that there will be it down way down the road but yeah, yeah. awesome um, yeah, basically anything I create, unless it's somebody's commissioning me to write a story or do something with their characters, pretty much everything I create in my mind is wired into this same universe and can be, whether That's it's cool. a different dimension or a different yeah. era or time, it can be linked to each other. Well, we, we call it the Beezerverse. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yes. There you go. You're the welcome. Beezerverse. <laughs> You're just... 
You're just on it today, Brian, with the, the names and the he branding is. of everything. Straight money, homie. There you go, buddy. That's free of charge right there, Chief. <laughs> well, cool. We're going to actually try something uh, on this episode for the first time. So yes. you're, you're the guinea pig. Yeah, you're oh, the guinea man. pig. Hope this works. <laughs> um, so I've got a deck of cards here and uh, they, sorry, deck of cards here. Okay. And, and each one of them has uh, a question. Um, and I'm just going to like shuffle it and pull the first card off the top of the deck and you have to answer it. <laughs> no choices here. I'm being more, I'm being more povich here. Like this wasn't, yeah, this wasn't <laughs> on the outline. I'm not the baby daddy. I was going to say, and, uh, the, sur- you know, survey <laughs> says that's family feud. That's not Maury Povich. What if they did a crossover of Maury Povich? And the family world, feud. The universe would implode on itself. <laughs> Maybe you should do that in the Beezerverse. <laughs> I like it. It'll be on Trash City. Episode, that's season two. It's season two. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a. Uh, I like this one. Um, so the question is, uh, which celebrity chef would you most like to make you dinner? Oh, celebrity. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, this is, I'm having like a Ghostbusters moment where I'm like, don't think, don't, yeah, <laughs> it's Guy Fieri. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, of course. that's all that popped into my head. I don't know it's, why people crap on him all the time. He seems like he's such a nice guy. He is. And he's, you know, he goes to a lot of awesome restaurants. He does. You know, it's just the, the shirts and the sunglasses on the back of the head. It's like, yeah, yeah. come on. Put your sunglasses <laughs> yeah. where they belong. Guys. You're like 55 years old. Yeah, I was like, How bleaching old your you, hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was honestly the first thing that popped into my head. Yeah, I bet he would make you some amazing, amazing like gourmet sandwich creation that yeah. you could only uh, find at a they diner, would be, uh, drive in and die. Off the chain, they'd be like was he says off the chain, right? Is that what he Probably. Says? Yeah, I would imagine <laughs> that's something he would say. <laughs> I was gonna say kicked up a notch, but I think that's uh, that's Emerald. That's yeah. Emerald. Yeah. Ah, yeah, um, yeah. Guy actually comes uh, and visits the hospital here in in Louisville. The I know he does a lot with charity. Yeah, a lot yeah. of charity. Is his restaurant still open? The Smokehouse is that still open? Oh, I don't know. We went there one time. It was pretty good. I was think it? so. Yeah, they, they had this like uh, nacho thing, and they they did nachos right. In that there was like some nachos toppings. Like more, more chips, nachos. more yes. toppings, you know, rather than, ha- and it was in this like tall can and they brought out the plate and they lift it, and up? They lift it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always wanted to cool. have that experience. Oh yeah. God, you devil. Yeah. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, God, okay. You beautiful bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm on board with that. Uh, I, I like I Fieri. All my friends make fun of me, but. I like him too, man. I, I I do too, Jeremy. Let's let's flip the script though, Jeremy. What what okay. would yours be? Um, I think uh, there's a what's his name? Shoot, I can't yes. remember his freaking name. The Swedish chef. No. <laughs> What's his freaking name? Now that's my answer. Thanks. <laughs> it's not bad. We'll just edit uh, this. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to edit this out. I've got to figure out his name. Google. Yeah, you know, I watched Chopped a lot on uh, the Food Channel, but uh, yeah. I can't remember any of the uh, like celebrity chefs or. The I'm a, actually. I'm going to text my there. wife. I'm going to text my wife. Do it. Bobby Flay. Bobby Flay. Bobby F- Rachel uh Rachel Ray. Rachel Ray. I can't want to say Rachel yeah. McAdams. I'll have, yeah, she can cook me <laughs> yeah. Rachel no. McAdams can cook me dinner. That's fine. Yeah, Rachel Ray, we have like her. So here's my thing. I don't dislike Rachel Ray. I just don't think her um her pots and pans, they make me mad because they're not practical. Like oh, yeah. most things that you would cook in the oven 
you would cook at like 400 degrees or more, right? Sure. Like that's just normal. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. Right. Her pots and pans or her pots that you would put in the oven, her, her dishes, her baking utensils and things cannot go above 350 degrees. What? Or they like melt. And you, you're sitting on the biggest conspiracy <laughs> of 2020. I mean, you right. need. We're like, breaking this thing wide open. <laughs> like my wife loves it. Like she loves it. She's like, oh, it's Rachel Ray's dishes. I'm like, they, you go to go to Kroger and get something just like it. And it can withstand heat because it's, it's supposed to be. In an oven. It's melting. <laughs> right? I'm just like, <laughs> like, really? I learned. We learned this. We didn't know this when we bought them. Right. So we bought them. And we 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 cooked a ham in the oven, and it was the the dish was red. It was a nice, it's a nice, good, sturdy, you know, handles. Nice. Oh, it was. And the, you you pull it out, red. right? Yeah, it's pay. Yeah, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> like, Holy crap! No. You, it got so hot the the pan turned red. Yes, the whole thing. No, it was already it was painted red. Well, when I pulled it out of the oven, it was black. And I was like, I feel like this is not supposed to happen. And so sure enough, we we cooked the ham at like 450 or something like that. And it was like double the amount of temperature. I'm like, how do you have something that goes in an oven that can't go above 350? That's weird, man. It just makes no sense. She's all about that slow cooking. I know. Slow and low. I don't have 14 hours to cook. Right. I'm like, I am not a professional chef, Rachel Ray. Mm -hmm. You got to wait for it with Rachel Ray. She's not going to cook it in a timely fashion. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I found it. I found his name. My wife helped me. His name is uh, Michael Voltaggio. Um, And he is like, uh, he's like a, gangster of cooking if that makes any like sense like he might make you a hamburger or shoot no, no. you no 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 uh it just comes up behind it's you just like a piano wire like tattooed like from it? like head to toe <laughs> that's a spicy meatball oh yes it is like tattooed from head to toe um he like he just looks like he will either cook great food or do awesome graffiti or both. It's, yeah. His name sounds fancy. Like yeah, he's I a know. guy that puts gold in his food, like gold. Yeah, flakes. and then does the sprinkle thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 yeah. no. He, uh, he's like about our age, I think. But it, every time, every show that I've seen him on, it's always like he always takes things that like you would never imagine going together, mm-hmm. but like puts it together, and um, he takes like off the wall ingredients and is able to, you know, like make it something that you look at and you're like, I I don't like all those things separately, but I can't help, but think that this is going to be excellent. You know, I never thought that, that mustard and chocolate chip cookies would go well together, but But dude, when that sounds tasty, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I would eat it. So he's an alchemist of food. Ooh, yes. I like it. Changes the flavors I like it. into something beautiful. And I bet his dishes can go up to 500 degrees in the oven and not, <laughs> not change Eight, colors yeah. and melt. Right. And to make your food toxic. So, um, well, all right. Steven, dude, thank you for being here, man. It was my pleasure. Uh, this was a great time. And uh, thanks for putting up with us. Um, Brian, well, that's, that's I want to say. Oh. Oh, there oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sorry. I will make no aspersions on his cast, no aspersion on his character from his look, but uh, oh, absolutely not. There is a little mob flavor there. Yeah, I like it. I felt I felt in danger for just a second, and I was like, no, he's going to make me a delicious dish. <laughs> yeah, sure. Brian, thank you for having me. Jeremy, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, and uh, absolutely, Brian. I want to say you're an inspiration in all seriousness. For oh goodness, oh goodness, oh for goodness. always. I mean, you're following your your vision and you're making comics man that's that's what i love and uh, you're always <laughs> even though i don't believe you all the time you're always <laughs> you're always positive at shows like you're like brian how's the show going for you like great awesome <laughs> i'm like i'm dying inside <laughs> i i'm not selling anything over here don't tell me <laughs> things are going great but i appreciate your enthusiasm your passion for making comics 
Yeah. Well, thanks, man. I, I I appreciate that, and and I got to say the same thing uh, about you. you, you, Phil, and Bruce. Uh, if it weren't for you guys, um, you know, kind of hanging out with me and uh, and showing me the ropes early on, uh, you guys were a pivotal part of me jumping into this. So, thank That's you very awesome. much, and I, I love what you're doing with Trash City. Really excited to see it come yeah. back out. And one last time for everybody, tell us where uh, everyone could find your work good sir you search trash city on webtoons you can go to my instagram at steven beezer twitter at steven beezer there's facebook too i can't remember all that <laughs> mess but um uh website trash-city.com um yeah go check out trash city tell me what you think shoot me a message on instagram check everything out and uh have fun, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. enjoy, enjoy Absolutely. the rest of 2020 everybody. Yeah. It's been party, it's been a ride party all year. Yeah. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to the dastardly dingoes podcast. Remember to hit like subscribe and share with your friends. Also hit that bell uh, to get notified whenever a new episode pops up. So as always, my fellow dingoes, have fun, be safe, and support indie comics. See you next time, everybody. See you.